I tell you the zebra story? Hmm? You, any of you know that story? Okay, I'll tell you this zebra story. This tells you everything you need to know about human beings. So it's, wor it's, worth, it's worth knowing. Okay, so zebras have stripes. And people say, well, that's for camouflage. And then you think about that for two seconds and you think, that's a really stupid theory because lions are camouflaged and they're like golden like the grass. And zebras are black and white, so you can see a zebra five miles away. It's like, there's a zebra, it's black and white. So the whole camouflage thing, that's just not working out so well as a hypothesis. Okay, so bio biologists go and they decide to take a look at some zebras. And so they're looking at a zebra at, on the herd because there's no zebra, right? Just like there's no fish. There are schools of fish and there are herds of zebras. There isn't a fish. Zebras are the same thing. There, there's not a zebra. There's zebras. And so you're looking at the zebras, trying to study a zebra, and you look at the zebra, and you make some notes, and you look up, and you think, oh, Christ, which zebra was I looking at? And the answer to that is you don't know, because the, the camouflage is against the herd, and the black and white stripes. There's a variety of reasons for the stripes. The flies also seem not to like the stripes, but, you know, usually people, things evolve for multiple reasons. But anyways, it's very difficult to parse out a zebra against the herd. You look down, you look up, it's like, uh-oh. All those damn zebras look the same. Yes, the camouflage is effective, but it's against the herd. All right. So then you think, well, we better identify a zebra so we can see what he's up to. So then you take your Jeep and a can of red paint and a stick with a rag on the end of it, and you drive up to the zebras and you paint their haunch red a little bit, put a nice red dot on their haunch, or maybe clip their ear with a cattle clip. And then you, you, know, you stand back and you think, hey, I'm pretty smart. Now I'm going to watch that zebra. So what do you think happens to the zebra? The lions kill it. Right, right, right. Because lions, they're smart, right? Hunter, hunting animals are smart. But they have to identify a zebra before they can organize their hunt. They can't just hunt the whole herd. They have to pick out a zebra. And so maybe it's like a zebra that's got a sore hip or something. And so you think, well, nature's kind. It just takes the weak. It's the, no, <laughs> zebra or lions like really healthy, delicious zebras, but they look like all the other healthy, delicious zebras, so they can't get a bead on them. But if they're small and just born, or if they're limping, or there's something that identifies them, then the lions can pick them out. And then they do pick them out. And so the rule for human beings is, Keep your damn stripes on so the lions don't get you. And I'm telling you, man, if you want to remember one thing from my class about human motivation, that's a good thing to learn. People camouflage themselves against the herd, and they like to be in the middle of the herd, which is what fish do, by the way. If you have a big school of fish, the smart, healthy, large fish are in the middle of the school. Because you know what you call fish on the outside of the school? Bait. Right. So... That's what people are doing. They're trying to move into the middle of the herd all the time. And the herd moves around, or the school moves around, and people are going, well, I'm in the middle. I'm staying in the middle here. So I've got this protective ring of people around me so the predators don't pick me out and do me in. So, you know, you're thinking, well, people are aiming at success. Don't, don't be thinking that. It's not by any means necessarily true. Trait neuroticism is a potential, mo a po a powerful motivator. And trait neuroticism is, let's not be too threatened or hurt, right? That's the negative emotion system. And the negative emotion system is a killer source of motivation. You know, you also see that there are scales of well-being that have been designed, mostly by social psychologists, which means they're very bad scales most of the time, because their psychometric capacity is, is, is absurdly low, generally speaking. So what you find with scales of well-being, sometimes they're talked about as scales of happiness even, is that people aren't after happiness, they're after not hurting. It's not, so they don't want to be extroverted and enthusiastic, right, and, and bubbly and, and full of smiles and laughter. That isn't what they mean by, I want to be happy. What they mean is, I don't want to be anxious or in pain. And so well-being scales tend to be something like emotional stability plus extroversion. But the big loading is on emotional stability, the reverse of neuroticism. You want to avoid suffering. You don't want to be happy. You want to avoid suffering. And one way to avoid suffering is not to let the lions gnaw on you. And one way of doing that is to stay in the middle of the damn herd. And so, and, and I, like, I'm not being a smart aleck about this. I understand why people do that. There's real danger to being visible. There's real danger in being visible. Now, you might be successful if you're visible, but you also might be dead. And if you're looking for people's fundamental motivation, that's it. It's they want to be invisible and they want to be left alone.